Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 129 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things that I think you should care about. Uh, if you have any responses, email me, email me directly. My email address is whoviating, W H O V I A T I N G, at AOL.com. Uh, and uh, if you prefer, you could go to my website, which is low. Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there if you didn't catch it. Uh, as always, please, when you email me, include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam, and um, be a little patient. I'm a little slow about answering email, but I do answer it. You will get an answer. All right, with that, let's get right to it. We're going to start off this week with another edition of our occasional feature, the Hero Award. This is our award that we give to people who, on some matter, big or small, just do the right thing. This award concerns events that actually began last May and reached a sort of climax in August, but the information only came out with the unsealing of court documents on October 3rd, so this, you know, is still current news. It involves Ladar Levison. He spent the last 10 years building up a business called LavaBit. This is a secure email system designed to secure the privacy of its customers. Uh, it followed the government's own secure coding guidelines and had systems that uh, were engineered so as not to log users' communications. So even if he got a subpoena for those communications, he would literally be unable to supply them. Now, over the years, he has received and cooperated with a number of uh, requests from law enforcement to wiretap a specific email account. Uh, but the request that came from the FBI last May was different. The government not only wanted to tap a specific account, which Levison was willing to do, it wanted LavaBits, passwords, encryption keys, and computer code, which would have essentially, uh, would have in fact, allowed the government unlimited, untrammeled, warrantless access to all of the communications of all of his customers. That was actually, well, he said it was like asking Coca-Cola to uh, reveal its secret formula or tapping an entire city in order to tap one phone. He said that was too much, and he resisted as best as he could. Uh, he proposed a compromise. The FBI refused. He was summoned to testify to a grand jury in Virginia. He was forbidden to discuss his case or even say it was happening, a gag order he is still under today. He was held in contempt of court and fined $10,000 for handing over his private encryption keys on paper and not in the digital form the feds wanted for their convenience. Finally, on August 8th, he gave up. He turned over the encryption keys and then on the same day, he closed down the business. He announced a decision on his website, writing that, quoting him, I have been forced to make a difficult decision to become complicit in crimes against the American people or walk away from nearly 10 years of hard work by shutting down love a bit. Privacy advocates say it's the first time they're aware of that somebody actually closed their business rather than comply with a court order that they felt was unconstitutional. They called it unprecedented. I call it the act of a hero. Now, there are actually a three quick footnotes to this. One, why did all this come down on Ladar Levinson? Well, because the person the FBI was concerned with, one of his customers, was Edward Snowden. Two, Levinson had some words of advice for others, quoting him, This experience has taught me one very important lesson. Without congressional action or a strong judicial precedent, I would strongly recommend against anyone trusting their private data to a company with physical ties to the United States. And three, after he closed his business, a federal prosecutor told his attorney that that was an act of defiance which was just short of a crime. Which... I love, just short of a crime means it's legal. And they're just ticked off that they couldn't do anything to him because of it. All right, moving on from there, I have a couple of updates about stories that we have talked about before here. Uh, back in May, first one here, back in May, I told you about the case of Caitlin Hunt. 
a then 18-year-old Florida girl who was charged with a series of felonies because to put it simply, she'd had consensual sex with a 14-year-old classmate. The real problem here, of course, being that the younger classmate was also a girl. The younger girl's parents never went to Caitlin's folks. They never approached them. Instead, they went to the school board looking to get Caitlin expelled and to the police to get her arrested, ultimately succeeded in both aims. Caitlin's mother, Kelly Huntsmith, said in a statement, quote, they were out to destroy my daughter because, she said, they feel like my daughter made their daughter gay. Well, the update is that Caitlin has now accepted a deal under which she pleaded no contest to three misdemeanors and two felonies. She will spend four months in jail, followed by two years of house arrest, followed by nine, year, uh, nine months of probation. Now, this case certainly brought out its more than its share of Bible-thumping bizarros saying that Caitlin Hunt was a sexual predator. But many critics felt, as did I, as do I, that this case would never have gotten this far if Caitlin Hunt had been a boy. I mean, first, in that case, with that girl's parents, now remember, this is in the absence of any sign of force or coercion or even deception. Would those, would those girls' parents have really gone to the police without ever talking to that boy's parents? Now, I expect, frankly, that both sets of parents would be interested in breaking up the relationship between an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old, but would that boy wind up facing literally decades in prison and a lifelong label as a sex offender, as Caitlin Hunt did at one point? This case was about, it is about, homophobia, especially the homophobia of the younger girl's parents. Now, in one of those laugh-so-you-don't-cry moments, uh, those parents released a statement saying they never had any intention to harm Caitlin Hunt. <laughs> right, you just tried to get her expelled and press felony charges against her, but you never meant to hurt her. In that same statement, those parents claimed the case was never about gender or sexual orientation, but about, quote, age-appropriate relationships and following the rules and laws of our society. Of course it was about gender. Of course it was about sexual orientation. Because if it was otherwise, if it really was about age-appropriate relationships and the rules of society, you would have enlisted the help of Caitlin's parents in breaking up that relationship and sent the help of the school board and the police in, ch in trying to destroy Caitlin Hunt's life. Now, you may not have succeeded in that. Uh, under the deal, if there's no further violations on Caitlin's part, the record can be expunged in 10 years. So you may not have destroyed her life, but you surely have damaged it. And I, for one, do not believe for an instant that that was not your intent. All right, next up. This is a sort of update uh, from last week's Outrage of the Week, which is about the government shutdown. This week, House scopper Dennis Ross of Florida said he'd support a spending deal that didn't repeal or defund Obamacare, becoming the first teabagger lawmaker to publicly back off the fight that he shut down the government. He said he changed his mind because the shutdown hadn't affected the Affordable Care Act, which anybody paying attention would have known that would be the case because the act is independently funded. Why, oh why, do we keep treating these people as if they knew what they were doing? Anyway, he said that's what changed his mind. But here's the thing. He said, we've lost the battle on the continuing resolution, but, quoting, we need to move on and take whatever we can get from the debt limit. What did I say last week? What did I say? The wingnuts and wackos genuinely do hate the idea that government has a responsibility to promote the general welfare, and they were willing to run off the cliff because they simply don't care who gets hurt. They're quite willing to see tens of millions of other people, including many of their own supporters, suffer in service to their troglodyte ideology. Ross has simply served to prove the point. The argument over the continuing resolution never was about the continuing resolution, any more than the argument over the debt limit will be over the debt limit. It's about attacking, undermining, if possible reversing, uh, even better discrediting, moves towards social improvement, mutual responsibility, and social justice. The bills are just a means to that end, and one will serve just as well as any other because they just don't 
care. All right, one last update I have to tell you about, and I have to tell you honestly, this is the one that really got me steamed. Four weeks ago, I told you about the case of Hani Khan, a 20-year-old Muslim woman who got a job at a Hollister company store. Now, Hollister, you have to understand, is a completely owned subsidiary of Abercrombie and Fitch. Well, she got a job with a uh, Hollister uh, company store in San Mateo, California, uh, only to be fired four months later because of the hijab, the headscarf that her religion requires her to wear. This hadn't been an issue when she was hired. It hadn't been an issue during the time she worked at the store. Not until some regional manager, some higher up, came to the store and said she couldn't wear the hijab because it violated the company's look policy. Now, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission agreed this was discrimination, sued on her behalf, and on September 3rd, she won in federal district court. Well, the update here is that it turns out that Khan was not the only Muslim woman to get shafted by Abercrombie and Fitch's creepy obsession with its look, and the results were not always as good as it was in her case. On October 2nd, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals dismissed a suit by an Oklahoma woman named Samantha Alauf, who charged she was not hired by an Abercrombie and Fitch store in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because of wearing a hijab. Now, as in Khan's case, the EEOC sued on her behalf. As in Khan's case, they won at district court. But the appeals court has now reversed that decision. And its reasoning reveals why the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals is considered to be one of the most reactionary courts in the entire country. The decision made note of this look policy and said it's intended, it's intended to promote and showcase the Abercrombie brand, which, quoting, exemplifies a classic East Coast collegiate style of clothing. The court completely embraced a and contention that the policy is critical to the health and vitality of its preppy and casual brand. By contrast, in Khan's case, the court found that the claim that allowing floor staff to wear a hijab would somehow hurt the company's brand image did not raise a triable issue, which means, in, evidence, in essence, that this was so irrelevant to the case, the case so weak for this, it wasn't worth the court's time to consider it. But the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals didn't care. When a &F says it must have to protect its profits, well, then it must have. And religious freedom, the Constitution, and the First Amendment be damned. Descending from the outrageous to the farcical, the court also said that Eloft never informed Abercrombie prior to its hiring decision that she wore her headscarf uh, or hijab for religious reasons and that she needed an accommodation for that practice due to a conflict between the practice and Abercrombie's clothing policy, despite noting that she wore the hijab during the job interview. Well, of course she wore it during the job interview. It's a requirement of the religion. What? Just how dumb are these judges? What's more, it is more than reasonable to think that as the applicant, she may not have known the details of this look policy. She may not have known even that his look policy existed. And even if she did, she may be completely unaware that wearing a hijab would be a conflict with it. What's more, it's also reasonable to think that any reasonably competent interviewer would know about the details of that policy and would know, they look at the woman wearing a hijab opposite them, would know that this might be a conflict and ask her if this would be a problem. Unless, of course, as is also entirely reasonable to think, the interviewer deliberately did not raise the question because uh, that way they'd have a basis for not hiring her, a basis that would be stripped away if they raised the issue and she responded by requesting a religious accommodation. In any event, this whole thing stinks. Abercrombie and Fitch stinks. And the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, looking for any way it can to advance a pro-corporate anti-worker agenda, stinks still more. Now, to be accurate and complete, I have to acknowledge that uh, three years ago, Abercrombie and Fitch changed this policy, even as they continue to fight suits over a policy so they don't have to pay any damages for a policy that they now essentially admit was wrong. Changing that policy doesn't change the fact that Abercrombie and Fitch stinks. We're taking a break.
And we're back. All right, now it's time for one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award, given weekly for meritorious stupidity. This week, the winner of the Big Red Nose is Tom Corbett, the governor of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, you need to understand, is the only state in the Northeast which allows for neither same-sex marriage nor civil unions. Well, earlier this year, one suburban Philadelphia county began issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. The state sued to stop the practice, arguing that an individual county did not have the authority to make that decision. Well, one couple that had been issued one of those licenses wanted to intervene in the case. In August, Corbett's lawyers opposed the move, saying in a filing that if two 12-year-old children had been issued a marriage license and tried to defend it in court, they wouldn't be taken seriously because the license wasn't valid. Put another way, they were saying that the court should consider uh, two adults the same way it would regard two 12-year-old children if those adults are gay. Now, that didn't go over so well with the public, as it turned out, so Corbett decided he would make it all better. In a TV interview earlier this week, uh, he said, and I'm quoting, it was an inappropriate analogy, you know. I think a much better analogy would have been brother and sister, don't you? So, in other words, in Tom Corbett's mind, same-sex marriage is not like children getting married. It's like incest. What a clown. By the way, as a footnote to this, later that day, Corbett issued a by now standard non-apology apology saying his words were not intended to offend anyone and he was really sorry if anyone else was offended. Like a typical clown refusing to take responsibility for his own words and his own actions. Just pathetic. All right, moving on to more important news than Tom Corbett's idiocy. Uh, we now have the latest climate assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, just came out last week, and what do we learn there? Well, for one thing, we learned that scientists are 90% sure that the period 1981 to 2010, that 30-year period, was the warmest such span in at least 800 years, and there's a two-thirds chance that it was the warmest such span in at least 1,400 years. There has not been a month with a below average temperature for that month in over 28 years. Each of the last three decades has set a new record for the warmest decade ever since 1850, which is about when reliable records of actual temperature measurements began. More. Okay, more. There's increasing evidence that ice sheets are losing mass, glaciers are shrinking, Arctic sea ice covers diminishing, snow covers decreasing, and permafrost is thawing in North America, in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say. So much so that over 180 native communities in Alaska may have to be abandoned due to flooding and land loss. Tide gauges and satellite data make it quote, unequivocal, unquote, that the world's mean sea level is rising and could rise as much as over two and a half feet by the end of the century. And while it remains impossible to blame any particular weather event on global warming, there's increasing evidence that global warming is tied to observations of an, an observed overall increase in severe weather, meaning oh, more, more storms here, more droughts there, more floods somewhere else. With the release of this report, scientists can now say it is extremely likely, that is with 95% certainty, that human activity is the dominant and perhaps the only significant cause of the warming that the global climate has seen since the 1950s. Now, to really understand the significance of that, you have to know that 95% confidence is virtually always as far as scientists will go with, uh, in cases where they cannot actually do a controlled laboratory experiment. This is about as certain as it's going to get. The fact is, humans are screwing with the climate to their own detriment. Period. Worst case predictions are that by 2100, temperatures could increase by as much as 3.7 degrees Celsius, which is over 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And that, I have to tell you, would be utterly disastrous for the climate and the people who have to live in that climate. Now that is a worst case scenario. But it still means it's within the realm of possibility unless we as a species stop being so damn stupid about the environment. 
And one of the ways we're so stupid, at least in this country, is the unwarranted and utterly bizarre attention and credence we give to a tiny handful of nanny nanny naysayers who, for whatever reason, will twist, distort, nitpick at, and where necessary, completely ignore the growing mountain of scientific evidence and data that say we are digging our own climate grave. Personally, I have to tell you, I have never, ever, not once, have I ever gotten into a dispute with someone claiming that global warming is, is anything from uncertain to overhyped to an outright hoax, in which I have not been faced with the same hoary, tired, long since disproven claims that were originated by the professional nanny nanny naysayers who were more interested in keeping the funding from the fossil fuel industry flowing than they were in facts or the future. Frankly, uh, I love the line at the website Skeptical Science that said, and this is a quote, arguing with some climate change contrarians is similar to attempting a debate with a well-trained parrot that has memorized some 20 statements and can squawk out at random. That is an excellent description of the experience. But I do have to admit that there are two relatively new nanny nanny naysayer claims I've seen recently. You might have heard about these, so I'm going to give a, a quick description of each. First is the relatively new claim of a pause in global warming over the past 15 years. A pause climatologists are supposedly unable to explain, which of course means the argument goes that the entire notion of global climate change has to be tossed aside and it's woohoo uh, coal-fired power plants for everybody. All right, let's start with a simple fact. There is no pause in global warming. Now, atmospheric warming, and remember, the atmosphere is not the only place the heat energy can go. It can go into the land, which is a poor uh, store of heat energy, or it can go into the oceans, which is a great heat sink, and where, in fact, where most of the heat energy gets stored. But atmospheric warming has not increased as fast over the past 15 years as it had during years previous. It's still going up, just not as fast. Calling that a pause is exactly like saying a car that had been going 45 miles an hour that's now going 25 miles an hour is no longer moving forward. The claim of a pause is based entirely on a deliberate statistical deception. It's done by comparing the year 1998 with 2010. Now, right off the bat, that's improper. Climatologists have long said that because of natural year-to-year -year variability in climate, to see a trend, you should look at time periods of at least 30 years, if not longer. But the fact is, we don't have to deal with that. We can accept this limited time frame and still show the lie of this argument. 1998 was an outlier. It was an unusually warm year with an unusually strong El Nino, which makes years warmer. And in fact, um, until 2010, 1998 was the warmest year on record, significantly warmer than the years just before or just after. So right away, um, starting from 19 1998, starting from this high point, is a bogus argument. It's deliberately distorting, it's cherry picking your data. But make just a slight change. Instead of comparing 1998 to 2010, compare 1996 to 2008. Compare 2000 to 2012. Even in those same limited time periods, you can see a clear upward trend. All right, now the other new claim is that the IPCC's predictions for temperature increases have been consistently too high so that the weak version, the danger is overblown, or strong version, the computer models used to make the predictions are, predictions are trash, so the whole idea of climate change is as well. The naysayers do this primarily by looking at predictions made in 1990, 23 years ago, when neither the models were as sophisticated nor the computers as powerful as they are now. But even so, unfortunately for the naysayers and their trained parrots, the claim is simply not true. It's a little subtle, so follow this. The point is, when you make these predictions, there's a range. It's like you're saying, well, over this time period, temperature is going to go up at least this much, but no more than this much, and the actual increase will be somewhere in the middle of that range. What's happened is that the actual increases, and this is the basis of the argument, have run below that projected middle of the range. The thing is, they have clearly been within the projected range. The models actually hold up quite well. Face reality, people. 
If we want our children and even more our grandchildren to grow up in a safe and healthy world, we're going to have to make some dramatic changes and fast. Now, will that involve cutting back, doing with a little less? Yeah, it will. But think of this. Think back to the 1980s, to, to the way you lived, the amount of stuff you had, the amount of technological convenience you had. Heck, if you're as old as I am, think back to the 60s. Think of the way you lived then and ask yourself if that way of life was so terrible that you would sacrifice a world to avoid living that way again. If the answer is, as I expect it would be for most of us, no, then let's get on with it. We already know the why we should change. Let's just focus on the how. All right, two last quick things I'm going to try to get in here. One is our other weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. The target this week of our mockery and derision is Hobby Lobby, more particularly its owner, David Green. Green is already notorious for suing the, uh, suing the government over the Affordable Care Act because he doesn't want to pay for birth control for his employees. Green won at the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Remember I said about it being the most reactionary court in the country. Uh, and the case is going to the Supreme Court. But that's not the outrage of the week. This is. Hobby Lobby recently opened a new store in Marlboro, New Jersey, and a shopper went in looking for a bar mitzvah card, only to discover there weren't any. When she asked about it, she was told there wouldn't be any. Why? Because we don't cater to you people. Another customer to the same store is surprised to find a lot of Christmas stuff, but no Hanukkah stuff, not a single dreidel. Asked why? Well, because uh, Hobby Lobby wouldn't be carrying that stuff. She called the home office of Hobby Lobby and discovered that Hanukkah isn't even one of their listed holidays. A third person, being unwilling to accept this as, you know, without confirmation, went into the same store um, and asked if it would be stocking any Hanukkah merchandise. No, and neither would they be stocking Passover merchandise, it turns out. Why not? The answer was, quoting, because Mr. Green is the owner of the company, he's a Christian, and those are his values. Those values, which also already included imposing his beliefs on his employees by hindering their access to birth control, now also include some of the crudest anti-Semitism I have seen outside of the darker reaches of the Internet. We don't cater to you people, indeed. That is an outrage. All right, last thing is our regular weekly reminder, but it's going to be a little extended this week with a couple of points. First, as of October 8th, at least 9,095 people have been killed in this country by guns since Newtown, at least 89 of them in Massachusetts. The two additional points I wanted to make this week. First, the FBI defines mass murder as the killing of at least four people in a single incident with no distinctive time period between the murders. As of September 16th, there had been at least 17 mass murders in the United States this year. Meanwhile, a subreddit called Guns Are Cool, which apparently doesn't actually think so, came up with a definition of mass shooting where four, at least four people are shot in a single incident. It's basically the same as the mass murder, except it doesn't require people to be killed. Uh, as of October 6th, they had compiled a list of 283 mass shootings in the United States this year. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. You have the best week you possibly can. We'll see you next week.